Father God, thank you for what Guy had to bring us about Genesis this morning. We thank you that the gospel starts on the first pages of our Bibles. And I pray that as he speaks and opens up this particular little passage about how we're being made in your image to represent your truth and your light, I pray your spirit will open our hearts to all that you have for us. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you, Richard. Cool, so good to be with you this morning, and I know you're having a look at Genesis 1, 2, and 3 uh, over this time, so yeah, I'm on that passage about uh, humanity and how we're made. One of the questions we did, therefore, inevitably come to explore on that midlife group was, who am I? Gosh, that's deep, isn't it? You know, who am I? Who really am I? What, and why am I here? Um, you know, maybe they're questions people ask all through life, but, you know, that was an exploit. So, so who really, you know, I, in one sense, I know who I am. I, and, you, you know, you might, I'm a social worker or I'm a teacher or I'm a businessman or I'm an architect or you know, I'm a vicar. Or, but, but who, you know, who really am I? Or you know, a husband, a father, a wife, a sister. Or, but still that kind of, what, what's my identity? Right on the inside, that search for identity, purpose, who you really, really are. And, and the world is full of, you know, I've, I've worked out, I'm ENFP. I don't, know, I don't know what you are, but I'm ENFP, so that, or ENF at J, depends, depends which, you know. So that's who I'm, I'm a, um, I don't know what you are, Myers-Briggs, or, or what number, I'm number seven or number four on the Enneagram. Or, you know, we, we like the, I like those things, they're interesting, and they're kind of like exploration. Or some of you might have done, Ali, my wife's done Ancestry.com. Anyone done Ancestry? You know, she's found out there's Viking in her family, in her. It doesn't help me to sleep safely at night. <laughs> knowing there's a Viking next to me. You know, but. So there's about searching, isn't it? Uh, who am I? Who really right on the inside? Uh, who am I and why am I here? And um, this passage we read in Genesis 1 answers that, doesn't it? Right back at the beginning, it answers that about who humanity is, who we really are on the inside. And uh, it, it takes us right back to the beginning, identity and purpose. And uh, there's three things I'm going to pick up from those verses, uh, chapter 1, 26 uh, through to 31. So who are we? we're made in God's image, number one. We're made in God's image. Number two, we're made male and female. And then number three, we're made to be fruitful. So that's where we're going to go in the next 20 minutes or so. We're made in God's image, we're made male and female, and we're made to be fruitful. So first of all, we're made in God's image, imago Dei. I failed Latin at school, so that's the only bit of Latin you're going to get. Uh, we made the image of God, the likeness of God. Richard was talking about walking his dog and the sunrise. I don't know what the most beautiful place, the most stunning place you've ever been to is. Just uh, One of the things Ali and I do is we lead, uh, sounds a bit grand to call them pilgrimages, but we take 10 or 12 people off on walks, long distance walks together. We've been up in the highlands of Scotland and the Lake Districts and across to Mull and Iona and some of those fantastic times reflecting on our lives and God, groups of about 10 or 12 together. And uh, We had this one moment up on uh, the northern shores of Loch Ness, up high there, beautiful, clear day, end of May it was, back about four years ago. And a group of us just sat there, we'd walk, walked up the hill, and you could look across Loch Ness, down to Loch Nessie, the snow caps of the, uh, of the mountains on the other side, and it was just stunning. Creation can be amazing, can't it? You know, you go to the mountains or the, the, the forests, the, look up at the... I mean, we live in London, you don't see any stars, but go and say with friends in the highlands, and sometimes the sky is just... Isn't the world incredible? So beautiful, so magnificent. I don't know where the most stunning place you've been, whether you go skiing in the Alps, whatever it is, just sometimes the world, doesn't it just sing of the glory of God. Our daughter had the, uh, went with a friend of hers from university. Their, their family grew up and live in Tanzania. She went off on safari last year. Some of those animals are like magnificent. And yet we're the high point of it all. Beyond all that, humanity, us, we carry the image of God beyond the rest of creation, in, in some deeper way, 
We carry God's likeness in a way that all the other creatures, all the rest of creation, in all its glory, but we carry something stronger than that, don't we? We are uniquely made in God's image. That's remarkable, isn't it? And, and people have explored, well, what, what does that mean? Is that, is that to do with our, you know, the, the potential of the brain, our intellectual capacity? Is it to do with our, our ability to make moral choices, good and bad? Is it to do with our capacity to love and to be selfless? What, what is it that marks out that image of God? And I, I don't know, really, but and maybe seeking to understand what it is. Maybe we're, we're just trying a bit hard, a bit too much for definition. Maybe we should just wonder at it, that we're made in God's image. In, in uh, just a, three or four chapters on from the bit that we're reading, at the start of Genesis, Genesis chapter 5, it, it talks about Adam, Adam who lived... Adam had a son who was made in his own image, in his own likeness. Exactly the same words. He's named him Seth, chapter 5 and verse 3. So Adam has a son in his image, in his likeness. And, and in some ways, the same words, that we are in God's image, in God's likeness. I have um, on my laptop, I, uh, there's a facial recognition thing. I thought it was quite cool when I first got it. You can kind of, don't have to bother, you just look at it. You know what, I don't know why I'm explaining, you know what facial recognition is. So, uh, so that's what I do, I can like top look at it. And, and uh, uh, at one point last year, my daughter unlocked our, computer, our laptop. She looked at it and it, no, she's 23 and pretty. I'm like, <laughs> what's going on? But in some ways, she's in my image, isn't she? It, she carries something of our image, of our likeness. She's a chip off the old block or whatever language we want to use. And, and we're the same with God. Isn't that incredible? We're made in God's image. We carry something of his likeness. It's astonishing. C.S. Lewis says, uh, look, look around you. Look, really look around you. Look at the people around you. C.S. Lewis says, there are no ordinary people. You'll never speak to a mere mortal. The touch of heaven, the touch of God on each of us, and, and obviously not just every, every person out there carrying in so special the uniqueness, the, the touch, the image, the likeness of God on us. I, I work, one of the things I do is I work in a pupil referral unit. And so with ch uh, young people, teenage, 14, 15, 16, all of whom have difficulties in school, troubled and, and challenging backgrounds and so on. And uh, uniquely made, carrying the image of God. Isn't that remarkable? Every person you meet, every person Richard will meet walking his dog and gazing at the sunrise, carrying that special uniqueness of God. And, and it can get damaged, let's be honest, isn't it? For some of us this morning, we might feel life's a bit of a battering. You know, life can batter us sometimes. And that, and that image of God, we can feel like, oh, I'm not really sure I carry it much. You know, I feel I'm much more of the dust of the earth than the breath of heaven. But still, however damaged, however broken, however affected by sin and selfishness and sickness and, and the pressures and the strains of this world, however much... People are, we're still on the inside. There is something of that image, isn't there? There's something of that beauty, that wonder of God's image on the inside, of immense worth and value. Psalm 8, which we read, said it, that we are crowned with glory and honour. Psalm 139 talks about that you, that I, that you are beautifully and wonderfully and fearfully made. I wonder if you can look in the mirror and say that about yourself. Can I look in the mirror and say, God, you made me well. With all of my damage and all of my, you know, all of my hurt and all of my struggles, still, God, you made me well. I am loved by you. I am fearfully and wonderfully made. I carry your image. So firstly, we are fearfully and wonderfully made. 
Secondly, we are made male and female. Verse 26 there uh, talks about, verse 26, 27. Let us make mankind, Adam is the word there, same root as the word for ground. Adam, let us make Adam, let us make mankind in our image. And then going on, verse, verse 27. So God created mankind in his, in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. Both male and female carrying the image of God. Both male and female made to rule in the earth. Both made equal, different yet the same. To share the image of God, to share the responsibility, equality right at the very start. That is God's heart. Male and female, different, complementary, but equal. It's interesting, isn't it, if uh, in that verse it, it talks about... Um, let us, verse 26, God's saying, let us make mankind in our image. Hmm. Us, our, plural. E even right here, isn't it? Even right here at the very start of the book, at the very start of the story, at that sense of plurality in God that obviously gets picked up as we go through the scriptures. You see it right at the start, of the, uh, isn't there? The, the spirit hover, as God speaks, the word and God and, and the spirit hovering, that sense, the hints of it that are picked up further on, aren't they, in John 14 and at Jesus' baptism and in the Great Commission and so on, that God is plural here. There's one God but plural, the same but different. Unique, united, but also separate. One being, but in three. That unity and diversity. And so we are made in his image, so what are we about? Unity, diversity. The same and yet different. You look at each other, you're the same as me, but you're different to me. Complementary. That if God is a community, we're made for community as well, aren't we? Made for relationship. Relationship with people who are the same as us and yet different to us, who complement us, who challenge us. And that is at the heart of, the, of faith. It's the heart of life is relationship, isn't it? Male and female, but not, not just in marriage or whatever, but something in our, our ability to create relationships that are, that are incredibly encouraging, supportive, honest, open, real, diverse, and yet united. Something in our ability to do that reflects upon God. And, and the relationship that is God. Uh, I wonder for you about that, how that works. The world tries to squeeze us into a place of isolation, where the walls go up and we get defensive and we get mistrustful and we get uncertain and we've been hurt and we've been damaged, so we're not sure about relationships. We keep ourselves to ourselves. We stay away. We're... The challenge is open hearted relationships. I, I did write here as in my notes um, that I would, I would finish this little section by asking you a question. So I'm a bit nervous if I ask you this question. So hear it in the kind of, I know you don't, not many of you know me, but hear this in. So what it says here in my notes, it's not my responsibility. I don't know who wrote this. Um, <laughs> it says, uh, at the end of this, I was going to ask, with who can you feel, with who can you be naked and unashamed? <laughs> I'm not literally talking about naked, but that's the challenge of our relationship. Who can you stand in front of and say, uh, you know me, you know me inside and out, good days and bad days. You know my strengths, my weaknesses, my challenge, my failings, my temptations, you know me and I feel safe with you. I think that's the challenge of our relationships, isn't it? To, challenge, to get to that point, not let the world squeeze us into isolation and defensiveness and so on, but have relationships that are open, a community where there are people we know so well that we can have that depth of commitment and encouragement and care for one another. I don't know how that works for me, how it works for you. So we're made in the image of God, the wonder of that. We're made male and female, different, the same, diverse, complementary, reflecting something of God. And thirdly, we're made to be fruitful. We're made to rule. 
I don't know if we're doing a great job at that, are we? <laughs> Our ruling over the earth. I'm not sure how great a job we're doing at being in the image of God or being complementary and diverse and male and female in our relationships, to be honest. But we're not making a great job. We haven't made a great job of ruling the earth, have we? But it's God's mandate for us. Rule the earth. Be fruitful. God's involved us in it. I know Richard did this a couple of weeks ago, but this takes me back to verse 2 of Genesis. The earth was formed. Anyone remember the Hebrew words? I think, I think you got them reciting it, didn't Yeah. The earth was formless and void. Tohu vohu. We want to say it together. Tohu vohu. Yeah, formless and void. Formless is without structure. It's chaos. The earth was chaotic and it was void. It was empty. Lifeless. Chaotic and lifeless. Formless and empty. And, and then I know you've looked at how God spoke into that and created order and filled it with life. So God is dealing with that. He's dealing with that tohu and vohu. And uh, part of us, then, when we get into Genesis, further down into chapter 1, into, chap- into verse 28, God blesses humanity and God says to them, be fruitful, increase in number, and then listen, fill the earth and subdue it. In other words, fill the earth, deal with the emptiness and subdue it, deal with the chaos. Deal with the emptiness and deal with the chaos. Fill the earth, fill it with life and beauty and wonder. Something splendid. Fill the earth and subdue it. Bring it into order. Bring it into shapes. Bring it into patterns. That is our call. That's what God's asked us to do. Just referring to some of the young people I work with and their families uh, in the referral unit. Gosh, sometimes their lives are... Vohu and Tohu. <laughs> Chaos and empty. And, and is it possible, is it really possible that God wants me to step in to that emptiness and that chaos and to bring something of heaven? To bring some order and some shapes and some patterns and to bring some life and beauty and creativity and wonder? Is it possible that's what he wants you to do in your place of work, in your family, in your community, with your neighbours, to step in to the chaos and to step into the emptiness and to carry and bring life and wonder and beauty? What would that be like at your work, with your family, with your, those down your street, to be able to step in under God and to deal with the tohu and the bohu? Wow, that he wants us to do that, that he wants to involve us in that. In the, uh, also, in the start of chapter one, it talks about, uh, we sang about the raging seas. I loved it when I saw that. I thought, that so, the emptiness and the chaos of chapter one, of the, of the first couple of verses, talk about the deep and the waters. And for the, for the people who read this, the early readers of this, that sense of the seas was about chaos. The storms and the seas and the Leviathan and the monsters who live in the deep and the great fish that swallows Jonah and so on. That, that feeling of the seas and was, was the places of disorder and chaos. Do you get the symbolism when Jesus walks on the water? Do you get the symbolism when Jesus calms the storm? It's the forces of chaos are being subdued. Jesus has authority in the earth. He has authority to walk across the emptiness and the chaos, the depths and the the fears, the uncertainties of the deep. He has authority to do that. He can calm the chaos and he can walk across the confusion and the fear. Isn't that wonderful? And he involves us in it. I'm going to finish with a a story. Our son, as we heard at the start, our son's getting married this year. So this is a story a long, long time ago. I know Richard's talked about making a home. 
creation about making a home. Well, we, we moved into a home, uh, this was when Luke was about five, I guess, or four or five or six, something like that. And uh, we were making a home, and part of making a home involved painting the walls. And so there was this wall that I was going on the stairway, I was going to paint it. And Luke saw that I was going to paint it. I got out the rollers and the paint and, and I was getting it ready. And he said, wanted to help. He was about five. And he wore, I remember the photo, he wore one of my T-shirts that went down to about there. So that, an old T-shirt, so it didn't matter. And so, okay, he's there with his brush and I'm there with the roller. And we're painting this wall together. It was pretty chaotic. <laughs> and I was uh, doing this and this and I'm doing it as well. And at the end, when we finished, he stood back, looked up at me, and looked at the wall, and proudly he said, Dad, look what we've done. And the truth is that I'd had to cover over his mistakes, and he'd splash things, and it would have been way, way quicker, and way simpler, and way easier if I'd just done it myself. Why does God involve us in the work of creation? Why does he involve us to bring life and to bring order? Who be, far be it from me to advise God, but God, you'd be much better off doing it yourself, wouldn't you? Be much quicker, it'd be less messy, it'd be much easier. But somehow in the wonder and amazing nature of God, he wants to involve you and me to paint the walls, to bring life, to bring life and structure and order, to bring beauty and wonder into the world. He'd rather do it with us than on his own because he's so relational, he's so full of love. He wants to include us. We're at the start of 2023 and I just wonder what walls God wants you to paint with him this year, what walls he wants me to paint with him, what whose lives, where he wants us to step in to places of chaos and emptiness and bring life under him with his spirit. And he'll have to cover our mistakes and we're not very good at it, but we'll learn and we'll get better. And he'll teach us because he wants to do it with us. Why don't you just close your eyes for a moment? Father, we, first we just acknowledge how incredible it is that we're made in your image. That we carry your likeness. And we know it's damaged and we know it's not what it should be. But it's still there, somewhere on the inside of us. We're fearfully, wonderfully made. With your stamp, your hallmark, your imprint on us. And we receive that for ourselves today. Where the world would batter us, we receive again that we are of great value to you. Great, great value to you. Precious in your sight. And Father, we also thank you and are astonished by your desire to involve us, to include us in your work in this earth. And we humbly and with, sometimes with a lack of confidence, we pick up that call just around this room today, just pick up your call to work with you, to be your co-workers, your junior partners. <coughs> Step into the chaos and the emptiness. Bring life, bring beauty, bring wonder, bring color, bring shapes and patterns and order speak into the chaos words of life 
Help us, Jesus, so help us, I pray. Because we're not very good at this. So please help us.